All right, finally, let's get it popping, shall we? Okay, so homies tier is essentially the S tier. It means I love them. That means they're awesome. That means I find them very interesting in some way and or relatable, but mostly interesting. Uh, real as fuck means I think they're great. They're not like, f like super favorites for me but I respect their role in the story and things like that, and I do enjoy them fine enough. They All Right kind of means, like, they're either inoffensive or, you know, they're not bad, but, like, they're not particularly compelling. And then Cringe Fuck You is exactly what it says. It's just like, fuck, fuck these guys. Um, and then again, Don't Care doesn't mean that I don't like anybody. But we're, we're here to talk about the students. Uh, extra fuck you, though, actually means extra fuck you. So, uh, the reason I wanted to do this is because I wanted to kind of go down the line and figure out exactly what house, in my opinion, is, like, the best one overall. Um, and I think I know how it's going to go, more or less. But there's a few outliers that I want to take a look at. And we can, like, tally up a score or something at the end if we give points based on the tier. Uh, so, we'll start off with the only perfect house in the whole game, and I'm not joking, which is the Ashen Wolves. I only played their side story very recently, and that was, like, kind of what reeled me back into Three Houses, if that makes sense. Because, like, after the first stream of Crimson Flower, I was like, dude, like, the monastery is not hitting right now, like, I don't miss all this tedium. I don't miss all the filler in between actually just playing the game. And then I played Cindered Shadows in the meantime off stream, and I love all four of them. I seriously, like, they're all so cool. Like, Yuri is a beast, and he's, like, clever and interesting. Balthus is, like, the perfect sort of, like, meathead uh, kind of dude, but, like, He's actually, like, kind of charming in that way. Like, y you gotta love him, dude. And, like, he's kind of different from someone like... I don't know, maybe maybe someone like a Raphael or something. Where it's like, they seem like kind of a big burly Dumbo. But Balthus is, like, kind of the best version of that. Um, and I've watched, like, his supports with Claude and things like that. Um, and he's actually more clever than he lets on, too, which I really appreciate. Um, and then Happy, I've watched all her supports with Byleth, um, and a few others as well. There's so many supports for all of these, I couldn't possibly watch every single one, but I, I feel like I have a good enough grasp on each one to at least form a solid opinion. Um, Happy, I think, is very interesting because she's, like, pretty obviously, like, jaded against the church, because they basically locked her away her whole life without trying to help her with her condition, which is when she sighs, she summons monsters. That's kind of fucked. Um, and it's kind of sweet watching the Byleth support because, like, Byleth gets the ring enchanted when he proposes so that she doesn't have to deal with that anymore. And that's awesome. I'm into that sort of stuff. Like Lysithia I was talking about earlier. Linhart is going in the homie tier because he got rid of Lysithia's crests. That is real as fuck. Uh, well, it's better than real as fuck because that's a tier. But <laughs> that's really sweet and really awesome. And then Licorice Boots is just... She's, she's interesting because I feel like normally a character like that would just annoy the shit out of me. But I find her so entertaining that it doesn't annoy me. Like she's very over the top and like kind of kind of insane. And then the duality of, like, her becoming, like, completely nihilistic whenever she goes outside is just very, very funny to me, and I can't, I can't really say much more than that. Um, so I find all four of them really enjoyable. I think it's the only perfect house in the whole game, which is kind of cheating because there's only four of them. It's much easier to write four good songs than to write eight good songs, if that makes any sense. So they're kind of cheating. But I love all four of them. I think they're all great. It's the only thing slightly motivating me to do another run of Three Houses where I just use them. 
like on a silver snow route or something, but yeah, I, I think they're all super, super cool. Um, and then we'll talk about Blue Lions because Blue Lions was my first run of the game three years ago and Dimitri is a homie. I think Dimitri is a very cool character because he has the sort of biggest growth arc of the three lords, kind of without a doubt. Um, as we'll talk about later, I think Claude is pretty much just Claude. Like, Claude doesn't really change a whole lot, but Claude is already just a great character. There's nothing that really needs to change about him in a drastic way. And Edelgard, I felt like, was a robot for most of Crimson Flower anyway. But Dimitri is very interesting because he starts off sort of as this, like, this sort of proper, like, noble kid. Not in, like, a snooty sort of way, but, like, you know, he tries to be honorable and do the right thing and, like, that kind of stuff. But to me, it always felt, like, slightly dishonest. And it's not because he's secretly evil or anything, but I always felt like it was almost forced. And that's part of his character, which I enjoy. And then when he goes, like, berserk in the Blue Lions route and kind of loses his mind for a while, it's, like, him doing a complete 180 on how he normally is. It's going from, you know, him being very cerebral about his actions and the things he says, and going complete opposite all instinct. And I think the best Dimitri is late Dimitri in Blue Lions, where he finds, like, a balance between those two things. Like, he's, he's gonna be, like a little rough around the edges and honest when he needs to be, but he's still doing the right thing. And I find that interesting. Like, he, he just becomes more willing to be his genuine self, if that makes any sense. So watching that sort of growth is interesting. The scene where he snaps at finding out Edelgard is the Flame Emperor is an incredible scene. I'd love Dimitri. I think he's great. Um, and then Dudu, I think, belongs in real as fuck and I think it's because the main detractor for me for to do is I'm typically not someone that resonates with the characters that are all like I will protect his or her highness with my life and like that's most of their character um, I think of Sigrin from FE10 that's like her entire character to me. It's just like, I will protect the apostle. It's like, okay, but like, do you have a personality beyond that? That would be nice. Um, and luckily, Dudu does have a personality beyond that. Uh, if you want recommendations for supports, I would recommend watching his support with Sylvain. Um, being from Dusker and dealing with the sort of racism that comes along with that um, is something he has to deal with. And his support with Sylvain is very interesting. Because Sylvain is also someone who deals with a lot of, like, sort of rumors or, like, people get a wrong idea of who he actually is without actually knowing them. And both of them get a better understanding of each other through those supports, which is very nice to watch. So I, I like to do fine. I think he's great. He's not a super favorite, but I think he's, I think he's a good character and I like him. Uh, Felix, honestly... I was gonna put in real as fuck. But I think he's a homie. And the reason for that is I really resonate with characters too. That will just tell you like it fucking is. That is so refreshing. And in the early part of Blue Lions where I felt like Dimitri was like maybe not being his complete full self at times. Maybe he was like being a little too restrained with what he actually thinks or feels. Felix does not. He lets it rip at any time. And I love that. I love characters like that. Ike is very much like that. If you don't know, I'm a big Ike fanboy. They're just gonna be as blunt as possible. And if you think they're coming off as an asshole, for one thing, you're right. But secondly, that's not the most important part of what they're saying. They're probably saying something pretty important that no one else will be, will be saying. Um, so I love characters like that. I think Felix is awesome. Um, and then Sylvain is also a homie. I fucking love Sylvain, dude. I love Sylvain. With a lot of characters in Three Houses, I feel like they sort of 
throw you a bait very early on where they'll paint a picture of a character that seems very one note, seems very one dimensional, and Sylvain's version of that is, they, oh, he's a womanizer character, that's it. He just chases girls all day, maybe he's a bit of a dummy, and that's like kind of it. But you quickly sort of learn that that is not how he is at all. And I love his supports more than probably any other supports in this entire game. Because once he actually starts to, like, care about someone that he's, like, supporting with, you see he's not, like, the smooth-talking, you know, sort of one-liner guy that he's presented as initially. And he's actually, he kind of fumbles his words a little bit when he starts to care, which is it's kind of endearing, it's kind of funny to watch. Uh, but more importantly, I think it's very interesting how they sort of frame him in the womanizer kind of archetype character. Because you look at someone like Sane from FE7, which that is most of his character, is just being like super horny, basically. Um, and like that's kind of it. They're like, there are hints with Sane, to be fair, where he's not just that, but it's mostly that. Whereas Sylvain, like, the reason he acts like that is because of the shit he's dealt with his whole life. You know, it's sort of like, for lack of a better word, uh, trauma induced. Where he's used to people coming up to him, you know, girls coming up to him and wanting to be around him for shitty reasons because he's a noble and he has a crest and they don't give a shit about the actual person. So, in this sort of rebellious way, he's like, alright, well, if everybody's just gonna be fake to me, I'm gonna do it first. I'm gonna get ahead of the curve. I'm gonna be a dick and I don't really care. You know, my brother threw me into a well because he was born without a crest and I, I was born with a crest. And he probably wants to fucking kill me. And I have to deal with that. I, you know what I mean? Like, he wants none of that shit. So he kind of, he kind of forms this sort of attitude of like, I don't really give a shit about myself. And that's why he acts that way. And in particular, if you want to watch one Sylvain support, watch the Mercedes Sylvain support. That one is so, so good. So, so good. I won't even spoil it. I just, I just recommend you watch it. It is so good. Um, Sylvain is actually, like, one of the biggest hearts in the entire game when you get down to it. I love his character so much. Um, Annette, I think... Although I really, really do like Annette, I think she belongs in real as fuck. Um... She's a very sweet character, eager to learn, all that stuff. Um, I kind of, I kind of relate to her in a way, um, in that she has trouble sort of sitting still and like doing nothing. Whereas I also tend to bury myself in work because I feel like super unproductive if I just like relax and do nothing a lot of the time. Uh, so that, that part of her really does resonate with me. Um, her hair in part one fucking sucks, though. <laughs> it gets way better in the time skip. Um, but yeah, I like Annette a lot. Okay, so up next, Ingrid. I think Ingrid is alright. I don't know why... I never really felt super into Ingrid's character. There's nothing inherently wrong with her. Like, this tier is, is kind of the tier where I'm gonna have the hardest time articulating why I feel a certain way. There's nothing wrong with her. I appreciate that she has like an already established relationship with Felix, Sylvain, and Dimitri. I find that pretty interesting. But she just never really stuck out to me all that much. Uh, Mercedes, I think, is no lower than real as fuck. I think she's a very sweet character in general. Um, not into the whole religious character archetype necessarily, but her, her, like I said, her support with Sylvain is already so good. She has to be up here for that alone. Um, but I like her talks with like Annette and stuff because they have a uh, a pre-established relationship too. Because they went to sorcery school, if I recall correctly. So I do like Mercedes. I think she's she's a nice, calm character to have around. Um, and because of her temperament, she gets a really good interaction with Sylvain that I really appreciate. 
Um, she was the one that I recruited out of house in Golden Deer. Because um, I have a tradition of recruiting one person out of one house with each run. Um, for Blue Lions, I recruited Dorothea from Black Eagles. Golden Deer, I recruited Mercedes from Blue Lions. And then Crimson Flower, we recruited Lysithia from Golden Deer. Um, so I, I do like her. Uh, and then Ash... I don't think Ash is inherently, like, super, super interesting. <laughs> Halo theme, okay. He's, like, such a sweet character that every time I hear him talk, like, you kind of root for him, you know? I can't help but like him. I want him to do good, you know? I, I don't know, I, I like Ash. Like, and again, he's not, like, the most compelling character ever or anything like that. But, like, he, he's such a sweet kid, you know? I can't hate on him. Uh, okay. So, now, we are on Golden Deer. And Claude goes in homies. Dimitri is excellent. But Claude, after some thinking, really has become my favorite lord of this game. I think he's just very interesting because... He's like a very clever and very intelligent character, and he's sort of an idealist in a lot of ways, but not an idealist in this sort of sense where he goes too far. That's the category where I would put someone like Edelgard in, where she's kind of like oblivious to her own fuck-ups, and I don't appreciate that at all. And then when we killed Claude in Crimson Flower, and the line he says is, like, Edelgard, I really do hope you make the world a better place. Like, that's the last thing on his mind. And that made me even more fucking sad. Like, he really, really does put the world, the continent of Fodlin before anything else. More so than I see from any other character. And he's not sort of mentally bogged down by restrictions that other people tend to place on themselves like looking for help from like the all myrans and things like that was something that like was unthinkable to some characters but he's like dude like you got to do this kind of stuff like we have to we have to fix this like together as people and all that and i i really i really 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 love claude uh lawrence uh, if we- if this was a haircut to your list, Lawrence would easily go and cringe, fuck you. That shit is awful, what were you thinking? It's not even a bowl cut, like you fucked up the bowl, you know? I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. Um, and on top of that, he's actually pretty goddamn annoying. Uh, but he's annoying in a sort of... ...funny way? Because... He's just kind of an idiot, like... <laughs> so, like, in, in that way, like, I do sometimes enjoy his antics, but he is a fucking moron. <laughs> and it's like, I watched his uh, Sylvain support uh, pretty recently, too. And he goes, like, Lawrence goes and, like, hits on some random girl in town, and he's super creepo about it. It's, like, really, really bad. And then she leaves, of course. And then Sylvain goes up, and he's like, bro, stop scaring the bitches away. And he's like, oh, like, you could do better. He's like, bro, do you know who I am? Like, I'm Sylvain, baby. And then Sylvain starts doing it, and then he starts fucking up too, which is, like, not normal, which is very funny. And then he's like, well, dude, they wouldn't turn me down if you didn't come in first and fuck it up. Now they're wary of everybody. And it's funny. It's funny. They just both, they just both fuck each other over. It's very entertaining. Um, so I appreciate Lawrence for being kind of an idiot most of the time and being full of himself without much to back it up. Uh, but his haircut is pretty bad. So can't put him higher than they all right, but I don't hate him. Uh, Raphael, they all right. And to be honest, I feel like I don't remember as much about Raphael as I would like to. All I really remember about him is food. And that's not good. Because, like, the food characters, that archetype is so boring. And I wish I remembered more about him. 
I just kind of remember him being a dope. Food, muscles, egg knots. Yeah, that's like it. I think he's a funny dude and everything. Like when they enter him in the dancing contest. Yeah, I laugh at that shit. That's funny. But I, I don't have like a strong opinion on him. I just don't think he's that interesting. It is funny though. I will give him this. It is funny that throughout the entire game, he never finds a shirt that fits him. You can always see his skin in between the buttons. That's funny. That is objectively funny. But, you know, definitely not a favorite. Um, and Ignatz, I remember Ignatz is like a painter, I believe. I believe that's right. So there's something there. Um, but again, I never found him particularly super interesting. I think he's fine. I think he's a nice guy and everything. But, I don't know. And this is, this is sort of... I'm starting to paint the picture here. How I generally feel is like Blue Lions has a lot of great characters. And then Golden Deer has some excellent characters. And then some real boring ones. Or ones that sort of like tread the line like Lawrence. So it's like, yeah, it's like very inconsistent for me. Um, Lysithia is an S tier. That's pretty easy. Um, we're not talking about gameplay so much, but as a gameplay unit, she's one of my favorite things. She's a mage beast that can also warp what's not to love. Um, I like her sort of backstory with her being the only surviving child of the those who slither in the dark experiments to get her a second crest. That is extremely sad and extremely fucked up. And I just find her funny. Like she tries to act all mature and it's like, oh, screw you, I don't need your help. Or like when Edelgard offers her like cake or something to like take with her, like back to her dorm. She's like, there's no need to pander to me, but I'll take it. It's just like, it's kind of funny. It's kind of cute. I love Lysithia. I think she's funny. Um, and in certain supports, like we saw with Linhart, and I believe the Byleth support as well, uh, her getting rid of the crests to possibly re-lengthen her lifespan is very good. I'm a big fan of that. Um, her and Syl Sylvain both kind of fit in the category of like extreme trauma and life problems because of just fucking crests. And they deal with it in very, very different ways. Uh, which is very interesting to, to watch and to talk about. Uh, Marianne. Marianne, I thought I wouldn't really like. Uh, I normally just kind of roll my eyes with characters that can't get their emotions out or will never say what they want to say just because it's kind of annoying but Marianne's kind of different uh Marianne is actually a very sweet character and I, I actually ended up liking her way more than I thought I ever would and like I understand why she's like that now um which is you know that's important uh, so she's not like that for no reason. And then you see hints in certain supports of her, like, sort of growing out of that. Which is also very sweet to watch. Like, I think in Sylvain's support with her, like, he basically just tells her to, like, smile more or something. And, like, she's awkward with it at first. But it's, like, it's the little things with her that's, like, very, very nice. Uh, and then Hilda. 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 I struggle... Whether to put Hilda in homies or real as fuck. I know she's going in, in a high tier somewhere. You know... You know, I might put her I might put her at the top. I think she's very interesting because... Um, if you take out... Oh, no, we're not playing this. We're not playing the Shadow the Hedgehog theme. Okay, we'll play Super Sonic Racing. Oh, that's funny. Um, <laughs> a little too edgy. But Hilda is very interesting because if you take out the reclassing aspect of Three Houses where you can make, you know, anybody anything. Um, one thing that's very interesting to watch in various Fire Emblem games is characters that show their personality through their class. And you lose that a little bit in Three Houses when you reclass everybody. But Hilda is a very good example of someone showing characteristics through their class and through their gameplay combat um, in an unorthodox kind of way. Uh, I believe someone brought up the example of Sarah in FE7 
she's kind of similar to Hilda. She's like, oh, just keep me in the back line. Like, I don't want to be involved. Like, let everybody else take care of it. And it fits Sarah's character because she's a cleric. Like, she can just kind of stand in the back and heal. And, like, that fits her character. That is her class. That that all works out. That all makes sense. And Hilda is the same, is the same way in her personality. But in gameplay, she's a freak of a combat unit. Like, she kills everything. But yet, she still tells people, like, Oh, I'm nothing special. Like, you should probably do it for me. I'm, I'm very weak. I, I tire easily. And, like, that's even funnier, because she doesn't want to do it, just out of pure laziness. But she's actually, like, super talented. <laughs> so, like, that duality is very, very funny. Um, and then Hilda, Hilda, Hilda is very funny, too. I think Hilda is pretty entertaining. Um, and then Leone. Uh, if you haven't played Golden Deer, I would expect you to put Leone in, like, this tier. But you shouldn't, because Leone's pretty good. Uh... If you view Leone at a distance, and you're like, wow, she's just the Geralt machine. She's just the Geralt bot. I get it, man. That shit is annoying. That is pretty bad. But like with Sylvain, she's another one of the characters that sort of suffers from being portrayed as a very one-note character initially. But if you actually get to know them... They're not like that at all. They're actually not one-dimensional, and they can be very interesting. Uh, so I like Leone. Her time skip version is way better looking, though. Nah, not a fan of this haircut. Maybe we'll have to do a haircut tier list, too. <laughs> okay. And I... Ooh, you know what? I'm gonna save Edelgard for last. So I'm about to put a bomb off with that. Uh, Hubert is bad uh i hate hubert i really do in the other routes he's annoying because he's just like the edgy annoying dude that never fucking dies like i swear in blue lions you have to kill him like four times but he just keeps coming back and every time i'd see him i already don't like him i already know he's the bad guy i already know he's an edelgard simp but he just keeps coming back and that is so obnoxious and I was desperately hoping, in the Crimson Flower playthrough that we just finished doing, that I would come to understand Hubert a little more. Maybe there'd be some kind of redeeming quality, or just some kind of interaction that would make me see another side to this person. And I didn't get that. Hubert still fucking sucks. I, I don't really feel like I learned much from him at all. There were, like, a few hints where he almost said something nice uh, in, like, the Petra supports and stuff like that. But every time he says a compliment to anybody, it's always followed by, but you're nothing compared to Lady Edelgard. It's like, dude, no one asked, man. Shut the fuck up. Ugh. No. Awful. Fuck you, Bert. Uh, Ferdinand Von Eyre. Honestly... I think I have to put him here. He's not an all-time favorite. I know he is a fan favorite. But I do think he's pretty good. Um, I think Ferdinand comes off as a bit of a bot at first. You know, he's just your typical oblivious noble. Um, and I don't think he has, like, insane, insane character growth or anything. But there are some hints of it, like in his supports with Dorothea. And coming to terms with, hey... Although I'm always trying to challenge Edelgard, I'm not actually going to ever win. It's like, oh, wow, someone's self-reflecting. Pretty good, you know? That's always nice to see. I don't love him, but I, I definitely, I like him. You know, I think he's pretty entertaining when he is being sort of a moron. Uh, his support with Linhart, the C support, is very funny too. Because Linhart is just straight dissing him. And Ferdinand somehow doesn't see it. And that's like, kind of funny. Um... So yeah, I like him. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'll stop there. Uh, Linhart, Linhart. I I said this earlier, and I'm gonna I'm gonna keep to my word. Linhart goes in homies because he got rid of Lysithia's crests. That is real as fuck. Again, with the whole one note thing, he's portrayed as just the nap character, Lamal. And it's not that he naps because he doesn't care about anything. He actually does have a passion somewhere. Um, it just tends to be not supported by people like 
you know, Hubert. They tend to actually shit on him for it. Um, so I respect that. I respect actually being interested in something, uh, despite, you know, getting, getting crap for it from people. Um, he ends up being pretty perceptive, and actually, amidst his sort of more annoying moments, uh, he does do and say some pretty nice things. Um, so I really appreciate him for that. He's actually one of the, the actual relatable characters for not liking combat. Like, um, a lot of these characters pre-time skip are kids. And they're just cool with killing people in, like, chapter 2. What the fuck is up with that? And he's, like, he, like, gets sick at the sight of blood, you know? It's like, hey, a normal person. Thank God, that's pretty refreshing. The only thing that irks me about Linhart, which I've touched on in earlier streams, is the sort of personality trait of watching someone practice something or try to get good at something. And you just kind of come in and you're like, hey, you shouldn't do it like that. You should do more of this without elaborating and what that means is he comes in and this is shown in like the petra support he's like hey you shouldn't swing the spear like that you're too slow like on on like the the upswing you're wasting time it's not as smooth and petra's like okay well like i, I kind of get what you mean but like could you show me more of what you mean or like say it in a different way and he's like i don't know man like i just read it in a book like i can't show you so it's like I don't like people like that. If you're gonna say something to help or give advice, at least understand it enough to actually be helpful instead of just popping in, being like, hey, you're doing this wrong. You kind of suck at this. And then being like, but I don't want to elaborate. I, it's not my problem. Like, that's kind of annoying. I really don't like that personality trait. But he does get a little better about that. And I think overall, the good outweighs the bad. So, I like him. Uh, you can't see him, but Caspar is up next. And he goes in they alright. I really don't find him interesting. He's not bad. But he he just strikes me as the sort of... Shonen anime protagonist. That's like, kind of underdog-ish. But like... Doesn't maybe deserve... Any sort of credit for that. Because, like, there, there are two different kinds of underdogs. There's the underdogs that are inadequate, and because of that, they put in the work, and they go crazy. And a good example of that is Leaf. If you've played FE4, Leaf starts off pretty fucking terrible. Dude does not have Pursuit, which is already really bad. And he's not a mounted class or anything. He has, like, swords. And it's, like, pretty rough, honestly. It's not great. And throughout Thracia, he's very much an underdog type of lord that's written in a good way. And then his class, promoted in FE4, is the coolest class in any game ever. Where he can use, like, every weapon, I think, except for dark magic. That is fucking insane. And I love that. So there's that kind of underdog that actually earns a title by the end. And then there's the underdog that is just kind of inadequate, kind of a moron, kind of kind of stupid. He's not annoying or bad, but he is kind of dumb. And he just kind of stays that way. I don't feel like Caspar grew in any way, physically or emotionally or mentally. I, I just think he's kind of kind of a dumbo. And not in, again, not even in like an endearing sort of charming way, like someone like Balthus. You know, they just want to fight and duke it out. But like, Balthus has like a little more to him, which I, which makes him interesting. That's why I like Balthus, but... Caspar is just kind of a, he's just kind of a dork. <laughs> like, there's really no better word for it. He's just kind of a dork. I, I don't know how else to put it. Uh, Bernadetta, Bernadetta... I think goes in they all right. I know she's a fan favorite too. I don't dislike her. I did dislike her at first. Um, by the end though, I think she, I think by the end she was like in this tier. But there was a lot of this in the early game, so I think it balances out to be somewhere in here. I think she's very similar to a character like Marianne, but just dealt with in a worse way as far as writing goes. Because there are several examples of her 
having interactions with other characters and sort of going outside of her comfort zone and growing as a person and all that stuff, which is good to see, especially in the time skip. There's like a lot of that. But the way they portray her, and I'm not blaming like the voice actress for this or anything. I'm, I'm blaming the writing more than anything else. She doesn't come off as like a relatable, anxious person that has trouble, you know, with like human interaction and dealing with things because again, she has like a rough home life and all that stuff. But she's just all the whining and the squealing and the screaming and the yelling. It's just so awful to listen to. And it, it sort of cheapens her character early on. And I, I really think they could have done a better job about that. I think she could have been like right next to Marianne in this tier. If they dealt with that better, but they didn't. Um... So I like her fine by the end, but god, I had to skip a few supports, like a few C supports in the early game. Because it is really annoying. Uh, Dorothea goes in they alright. Uh, she has a couple good supports, but sometimes she can be a little weird. Um, I feel like most of what she talks about is just like falling in love, settling down, like that kind of crap. And yet, she's all high and mighty about turning down nobles. But then, a sentence later, she talks about marrying money and having an easy life. So she's like kind of contradicting herself, while also talking about mostly one thing. Uh, her support with Ferdinand was pretty interesting. I did enjoy that. But I don't find her very compelling. And I feel like, oddly enough, like there are some scenes in Three Houses where every student in your house will just talk about how much they love you and how awesome you are. And, you know, that's annoying. Uh, I don't like that. But there are some points where only Dorothea does that. And no one else does that. But she's fine. She's a singer. You know, you get points for that. That's cool. But it's, a, it's okay. Okay, and then Petra is... No lower than real as fuck. Uh, the sort of... Issue I'm having of which tier to put in out of these two is simply do I find her super compelling enough to put in homies? And I'm not sure that I do. I know that I do find her a very funny and endearing sort of character, a very honest character that is just trying to make her way in this world that she knows very little about. She's trying to learn a whole new language. That's gotta be fucking daunting. And her her language slip-ups is very endearing and very funny. Um, she, she's, it's, it's, I think it's impossible to dislike Petra. I really do. I don't know how you could, but you know, if, if Linhart isn't homies, I think Petra deserves to be there too. I think that would be a little, a little wrong for me to do that. So I'll leave that there. Okay. And then we have Edelgard. I'm gonna put on this song, okay? Let's talk about Edelgard, okay? So in Blue Lions, it's pretty easy to dislike Edelgard. She's the obvious bad guy, and her backstory involving Dimitri really makes you not like Edelgard. And the end scene in Blue Lions where she throws the dagger that he gave her into his chest with her dying breath is like the ultimate fuck you, okay? So I hated Edelgard, right? And then I play Golden Deer, and I'm like, you know, maybe I don't hate her as much because like she doesn't have beef with Claude necessarily, but I still don't like her. And then I got burnt out on Fire Emblem and I didn't play Fire Emblem for two years. And Path of Radiance brought me back because that game is good. Uh, in like late 2021 so then eventually recently in like the past few weeks I decided man it's finally time to do Crimson Flower I gotta understand why so many people like Edelgard I gotta know I have to see something that makes me understand why she does the things that she does how she justifies them and if it's all worth it in the end and here's the thing I think I was I was with her the most at the beginning of Crimson Flower because that was when I was 
most open-minded. And I was like, all right, I'll give you a chance. I'm playing the route. I'm watching the story. I'm giving you a shot. Show me why. And at every turn, she disappointed me. At every turn, she would do something stupid. She would say something hypocritical or something that didn't make sense. While being this stone-cold character that does not seem to feel remorse for anything. And that's one issue. She doesn't have to be the most human character ever. And I think I would have liked her slightly better if she kept that facade up for the whole run. If she committed to it, I would at least respect her for committing to it. But she couldn't even do that. She has some of the dumbest fucking interactions I've ever seen with Byleth, and it pisses me off. It actually makes me mad. Because... She's portrayed as a stone-cold character that is just doing it for the greater good that, again, she's a huge hypocrite about in most of what she says and does. The things she says to Rhea, and we saw it in the late game, are things that she was also doing, like mass bloodshed and all that stuff. You know, f creating basically a fucking apocalypse, in a sense. And she has the audacity to stand on her high horse about it the whole time. And again, if she would have kept to that stone-cold person, unwavering, impassionate, whatever, that would have been fine. I would have been like, you know what, I still don't really think it was all worth it, but fine. I was with the initial concept, you know, separation of church and state, essentially, that's pretty good. No crests, that's pretty good. But then, they have these scenes with Byleth, outside of supports, I might add, where she just blushes at nothing, at like regular conversation, and then there's a random scene where she like screams in the middle of the night while Byleth is like walking through the hallway, and he goes in there, and she's like all freaked out because she saw like a mouse or something, and the dialogue options for Byleth are like, oh that, that squeal was so cute, twice in a row, Byleth has the option to fucking say that, which is very cringe. Again, outside of a fucking support, so it's not like the player is actively simping for her or something. It's just there, and I don't know why. It's almost like the only reason you should play this route is if you're gonna simp for Edelgard, because none of the other stuff makes up for it. And it's just so off-putting and so bad. And they try to humanize her in these, like, really cheap ways. And it's just, it's horrible. It's just bad it completely ruins it and i think it has so much potential because again her initial concept i agree with but when you're so inconsistent in your words and in your character and you're written so fucking poorly and in order to get this this greater good mission accomplished you place your trust and power, because she is not in complete control, to the big villains of the entire game, those who slither in the dark, and then, oh yeah, after the fact, you just just take our word for it, we deal with them in the epilogue, Lamal. What? Are you fucking kidding me? Is that not the stupidest thing ever? Like, what? Where are the redeeming qualities? I really want to know. I don't get it, man. I think if you play this route and you're just in love with Edelgard to begin with, I think you can sort of look past a lot of stuff. And I think some of the things maybe are, are just okay with you. But I did not feel that way at any point with Edelgard. Even before I played any of the routes, Edelgard was the least interesting one to me. I wanted to go Blue Lions and I wanted to go Golden Deer way before Black Eagles. So, unless you resonate with her from the start, and pick Black Eagles first, and then also simp for her, I don't think most people like the Crimson Flower route if those three things are not true. I have a hard time finding where anybody would change their mind with how poorly it's all written. It's a fucking disaster. And Edelgard did something wrong! <laughs> so yeah, there, there it is. There it is. <laughs> Oh, dude, I'm fucking out of breath. <laughs> uh. 
Okay, I, I can relax now. That's my fucking Edelgard rant. I, I had that fucking pen up, dude. <laughs> oh, dude. Holy shit, man. Yeah, she did do something wrong. Arvis did not, but she absolutely did on multiple occasions.